I think that this latest work from Dr. Hansen, titled Global Warming in the Pipeline, really should be taken as a key warning for uh, this conference that we had better not fail. And in particular, I think the major nations, as well as the rest, need to commit to a complete phase-out, an orderly phase-out of fossil fuel production and utilization. attending this session of the Climate Emergency Forum. Uh, we'll be discussing global warming and the pipeline and Earth's energy imbalance. Now, as some of you may have read the press release, this uh, particular panel was to feature Dr. James Hansen. Uh, it turns out at the last minute he was not able to show up. However, um, we do have video that's specially prepared for this session. Uh, my name is Regina Valdez. I'm with the Climate Emergency Forum, and I am sitting here today with Dan Galpern. Now, Dan Galpern is James Hansen's longtime legal and policy advisor. He is also founder and general counsel, as well as executive director for the Climate Protection and Restoration Initiative. Dr. Hansen, he's uh, the former director of NASA Goddard Institute of Space Studies, and he's a current director of Climate Science Awareness and Solutions. Uh, this is a program that is at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. We're gonna go ahead and start, uh, as I mentioned, with Dr. Hansen's specially prepared message for us. Thanks very much, Jeff, and uh, thanks to your people and uh, your program for hosting uh, this discussion. We're honored. And I, I also want to thank my uh, co-authors for their unique scientific expertise and contributions to this paper, and uh, the editor-in-chief of Oxford Open Climate Change, Ilko Rowling for inviting me to include my perspective about policy implications, which is the final section of the paper. So the climate on our remarkable home planet is characterized by delayed response and amplifying feedbacks, which is a recipe to lock in intergenerational injustice. So, we climate scientists have an obligation to explain this situation clearly as best we can, especially to young people, and to include the policy implications. Because if we don't include the implications, people who have a special financial interest will make their own conclusions. In 1979, the Charney Report of the US National Academy of Sciences estimated, based on climate models, that global climate sensitivity was three degrees Celsius for doubled atmospheric CO2, but a very large uncertainty. Soon thereafter, it was realized that a much more reliable measure of climate sensitivity could be obtained empirically from the precise knowledge of glacial to interglacial CO2 change provided by ice core data. But this empirical evaluation also requires knowledge of global average glacial to interglacial temperature change. And that remained uncertain because of a misleading evaluation of glacial sea surface temperatures that persisted for 40 years. The wrong assumption was that microscopic species in the ocean surface layer would migrate as climate change, so they would always be at the temperature they prefer today, rather than partly adapt over millennia to temperature change. Now, recently, Jessica Tierney 
and her then postdoc, Matt Osmond, who was our uh, co-author, developed a global temperature analysis omitting the biology data, but using widespread geochemical proxies, isotopes. And Alan Seltzer used noble gas abundances in groundwater from last glacial maximum at latitudes 45 south to 35 north to evaluate uh, global temperatures, the glacial temperatures. In our paper, we show that the Tierney Osman and Seltzer analyses are consistent, implying a glacial to interglacial temperature change of about seven degrees Celsius. We now know the surface temperature during the glass, last glacial maximum and the forcings that maintained the ice age cold. Together, these imply a climate sensitivity of about 4.8 degrees Celsius for doubled CO2. IPCC's best estimate of three degrees is excluded with greater than 99% confidence. This high climate sensitivity has major implications for global warming in the pipeline. Clouds are the mechanism in climate models that permits a broad range of climate sensitivities. So wait a minute, if climate sensitivity is high, how can climate models with a smaller climate sensitivity, which is most models, obtain realistic global warming for the past century? The answer, the second of the two important climate forces, aerosols, are an unmeasured free parameter. And models with low climate sensitivity can compensate by understating the aerosol cooling. So aerosols are, are fine airborne particulates. They are a health hazard killing several million people per year. Aerosols also cool the climate by reflecting sunlight to space, their main effect being as condensation nuclei for cloud drops. They slightly increase cloud cover and make clouds a bit brighter. Humanity made a Faustian bargain by offsetting a substantial but uncertain fraction of greenhouse gas warming with aerosol cooling. Now, as we want to reduce all uh, the chronic health effects of aerosols, our first Faustian payment is due. The payment is acceleration of global warming. China reduced its aerosols in the past 15 years, and aerosols from ships decreased in 2015, and especially in 2020. So we expect the post 2010 global warming rate to increase at least 50%, which is the lower edge of the yellow area. If we are right, the 12 month running mean temperature will rise above the yellow region by next spring as the current El Nino peaks. The mean temperature for the rest of this decade will be at least 1.5 degrees Celsius warming and two degrees Celsius global warming will be reached within 20 years thereafter. Although aerosol climate forcing is unmeasured, there's a great inadvertent aerosol experiment now ongoing that helps to educate us. The International Maritime Organization imposed regulations on the sulfur content of ship fuels in 2015 and tightened the regulations in 2020. This should have a detectable effect on clouds, decreasing cloud cover and cloud brightness, and thus increasing the sunlight absorbed by Earth, especially in the North Pacific and North Atlantic regions where shipping is the source of a large fraction of the sulfate aerosols. The satellite data suggests that absorbed solar radiation is increasing. It's highly variable because of natural variations of cloud patterns, such as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, 
But since the strong regulations on ships went in effect in 2020, solar radiation absorbed by Earth has increased about three watts per meter squared in the North Pacific and North Atlantic. On global average, the solar radiation absorbed by Earth has increased about one watt per meter squared. This increase of absorbed solar radiation is the reason that Earth's energy imbalance has almost doubled since 2015. When I gave a TED talk uh, more than a decade ago, Earth's energy imbalance was about six tenths of a watt per square meter, which is equivalent to 400,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs per day, that much energy being poured mostly into the ocean. That imbalance has now doubled. That's why global warming will accelerate. That's why global melting will accelerate. Let's look at the absorbed solar radiation again. If this is not noise, and I don't think it is noise, this one watt increase is a BFD, a big fucking deal. Let's compare it with greenhouse gas climate forcing. The greenhouse gas climate forcing has increased about 0 0.045 watts per meter squared per year, which is almost half a watt per decade. So the one watt increase of absorbed solar ra radiation is equivalent to more than a 20 year increase of greenhouse gases at their current high rate of increase. That's why I can say with confidence that global warming will now accelerate. Let's first look at greenhouse gases. Uh, several uh, years ago, IPCC defined a scenario, RCP 2.6, aimed at keeping global warming less than two degrees Celsius. But the real world overshot the plan. We could close the gap by extracting CO2 from the air, but the annual cost now has reached 3.5 to $7 trillion based on estimates of David Keith on uh, CO2 extraction. The cost of offsetting the decreased aerosol cooling would be 115 to 230 trillion dollars. Conclusion: the two degrees Celsius global warming limit is dead unless we take purposeful actions to alter Earth's energy imbalance. The first thing. Uh, that we must do is reduce emissions as rapidly as possible. But fossil fuels are providing most of the world's energy, almost 80%. Most of today's emissions and future emissions are from emerging economies, nations that want to raise their living standards. The task is to reduce the carbon intensity of global energy to near zero, but we reduced it only from 0.8 to 0.7 in the past half century. It's not plausible for it to go to near zero by mid-century. Sweden did well by decarbonizing its electricity in part by building nuclear power plants. Now, my last chart on the fundamental required actions, none of these are occurring. A rising carbon fee is the fastest, most effective way to affect all uses of fossil fuels, but the fossil fuel industry has prevented it. Instead of East-West cooperation, our politics and special interests have led to a focus on economic and military hegemony, which is foolish because we're all in the same boat. 
and will sink together if we don't work together. I don't think that anyone asks young people if this confrontational approach is the kind of world they wish to aim for. The 1.5 degree limit is deader than a doornail, and the two degree limit can be rescued only with the help of purposeful actions to affect Earth's energy balance. We will need to cool off Earth to save our coastlines, coastal cities worldwide and lowlands, while also addressing the other problems caused by global warming. Now, it will take uh, several years for socialization of uh, what is needed for the public to understand, which will be aided by the increasing problems that they will see from global warming. That several years will provide the time that young people need to understand this matter. And specifically, the fact that I believe a political party that takes no money from special interests is probably an essential part of the solution. Young people should not underestimate their political clout. Thanks. Now we're going to hear from uh, Professor Hansen's, as I, as I mentioned, his longtime legal and policy advisor, and that is Dan Galpern. So Dan, uh, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Regina. It's good to be with everyone here. I'm so impressed by all the dedicated activists from civil society who have come to COP demanding stronger action. And in fact, I think that this latest work from Dr. Hansen, titled Global Warming in the Pipeline, and published by the Oxford Open uh, Climate Change Journal, really should be taken as a key warning for uh, this conference that we had better not fail. And in particular, I think the implication for this specific conference and its agenda over the next few days is that the major nations, as well as the rest, need to commit to a complete phase out, an orderly phase out of fossil fuel production and utilization. Uh, now, Dr. Hansen also talked about other things that are necessary to restore Earth's energy imbalance. And it, of course, it is significant news that such a person as Dr. Hansen has also seen fit to warn that we are so far down into the realm of dangerous climate change that we need to do more than merely just reduce emissions. And of course, we need to do more than grasp uh, other meaningless bromides like net zero, net zero emissions. Instead, as I say, we need to rapidly phase out fossil fuel emissions, which means no new investments in fossil fuel infrastructure to start, and then an orderly phase out of uh, reliance on fossil fuel production and utilization, and also enhanced research and development in the area of other climate interventions that may be necessary to cool the climate, to preserve coastal cities and regions around the world uh, while the uh, business of decarbonization uh, gets underway and uh, goes to fruition. In any event, thank you for the opportunity. I'm happy to discuss any of this. Well, you brought up the business of decarbonization, and Dr. Hansen all but made it, I thought, fairly clear that that wasn't going to happen soon enough and wasn't financially feasible. So when you speak to decarbonization, I'm wondering how exactly you mean it. It'll look differently in different countries. But here, uh, the conference can set the agenda by st stating clearly that what is needed is a actual phase out of fossil fuels, not a mere phase down of emissions coupled with speculative promises with respect to negative emissions technologies, uh, carbon capture, um, direct air capture, the rest, enhanced research into those potential 
solutions uh, is necessary, but we cannot rely on those. So there needs to be rapid de decarbonization, first and foremost in the nations that are most responsible for our current predicament, which is in, in fact the United States and a number of other major industrialized nations. That's what I think it needs to look like at minimum. Thank you so much. Um, I actually do have some other questions, but I know that there, uh, this is a rare opportunity for some people in our audience to meet with you, Dr. Hansen's longtime counsel, and I'm just wondering if there are questions um, from the floor for Dan Galpern. Uh, looks like we do have one question. Well, uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Hansen for an excellent presentation. It's the most clear uh, presentation on this matter that I have personally uh, heard. And also thank you for representing him here and my question is, absolutely, we need to decarbonize. And it's still an open question whether we can achieve that on technical front, but that's the absolute goal. But there's another issue, which is when you have more efficient production of energy, history has shown that we, it leads to a faster extraction of all forms of energy, uh, including fossil fuel. So it seems like the funder, uh, underlying mechanism of capitalism could be one of the major things that we need to shift. So I want to hear like, how the team is thinking along these lines. As, as I think you indicated, we don't have time to, to fully uh, create uh, an entirely new economic system. We have to deal with what we have right now. So and Dr. Hansen is in favor of trying to ensure that fossil fuels pay their fair price. So if we had a <clears throat> fair and reasonable price where the actual social costs of carbon are internalized uh, in the price of oil, gas, and coal, then that would uh, materially help. Uh, we don't have that now. In fact, we have virtually no real incentives and no real limits uh, on supply. Uh, there are some increased incentives, including in the United States, but also in the European Union, to reduce demand. But unless we also get at the question of supply, uh, we're not likely to make the, to achieve the speed of decarbonization that's necessary to uh, preserve our fragile planet. One of the things that, that I found most notable is that, of course, uh, fossil fuel is still being used to fuel the economies of, of lesser developed nations. And so in terms of climate justice, which has been a big topic of conversation of last year in Egypt and, of course, this year, how can we speak to those nations and encourage them to draw down their use of fossil fuels when they're just now beginning to, you know, to grow as countries. Right, well, it's, it's uh, the basic outline is contained in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The nations have common but differentiated responsibilities to uh, deal with this uh, problem. There is a very small step in the right direction, perhaps, uh, here at COP with the announcement of uh, uh, additional funding for loss and, new funding for loss and damage and uh, potential new uh, funding source for uh, climate finance. Um, I, I, in my opinion, however, the amount that has been pledged to date by the na nations is probably one one thousandth of what is going to be necessary in that regard. Clearly we're in this together, as Dr. Hansen said. And so we need to figure out a way of powering the future, including of, of less developed countries and future generations that does not impose a burden on the planet. Thank you so much uh, for that, Dan. It looks as though um, we are out of time. So I want to thank you all for remaining here, despite the fact that Dr. Hansen is not here. His message is the same uh, via video as it would have been if you were here. So thank you so kindly. And in terms of thanks, I would also like to thank Sustainable Population Australia for making this panel uh, um, possible, as well as the International Society for Ecological Economics, and of course, the Climate Emergency Forum. And many thanks to all of you once again for showing up here today. Thank you so much.